So please give a warm welcome to Andrew Collins. You've heard the name Gebekli Tepe a few times, and there is no question that this is probably one of the hottest subjects in the whole of archaeology at this time. Um, so I want to basically go into some aspects of it um, and get the ball rolling as far as what it's about. Okay, now, Gebekli Tepe was actually discovered um, as far back as 1963. Um, a uh, an archaeologist by the name of Peter Benedict um, was surveying sites in southeast Turkey as potential archaeological sites. Um, and he came to Quebec to Tepe, which is on, on the top of a, of a lonely mountain, um, very near the city of, of Şanlıurfa, is how it's correctly pronounced, it's there as Urfa, Şanlıurfa is its new name. Um, and he surveyed the area and found that there were prehistoric flints all over the place. Um, and he also found bits and pieces of limestone blocks with carvings on, but so refined and so sophisticated were there that he actually dismissed them as part of a Byzantine cemetery. Um, and he logged the site under the number V52-1, and the whole lot was forgotten about um, until 1994, when a German archaeologist by the name of Dr. Klaus Schmidt, who you can see here, um, who was with the University of Heidelberg, but was working on behalf of the German Archaeological Institute and Schanlufer uh, Museum, came across this site and he immediately recognised it as part of a culture that thrived in this area, which is known as the pre-pottery Neolithic. Um, and what this means is it's a time frame when pottery was not in use, so we're just using stone vessels. There was no ceramics um, around at all, not, to, 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 not to, notably at least anyway. And he recognised that these limestone blocks were part of, um, of enclosures, so-called cult buildings, which he <laughs> earlier worked on at another site by the name of Navali Chori, which was about sort of 50 miles um, away from, from this location. He'd worked there for a number of years, and he realised almost immediately that this was an extraordinarily ancient complex, almost certainly with some kind of um, religious purpose. Um, and, you know, he put in the, the application to start working there, um, and excavations began in 1995 for the first time. Now, the general public was not really aware of this site until the year 2000, um, when a major article was published in a German magazine. And that's where I first picked up on it, because I'd already been working on this particular culture um, for my book, From the Ashes of Angels, which came out in 1996. And I was actually writing that at the very time that the, that the Spains were unearthing the first enclosures at Quebec de Tepe. And basically what I'd said was that this area was the cradle of civilization. Um, it was the place of the Neolithic explosion, it was the place of the Garden of Eden, and that something very profound had gone on in this area. Probably the intrusions of people from uh, some other part of the ancient world had kick-started everything. And then in this very location, Gebekli Tepe was discovered. So, you know, that's, that was really important to me, and I knew how important this was. Um, and that's why I was on to it at that time. Now, there are four main enclosures um, together in, in the main area um, on the top of the hill. Now, they're constructed around 9,500 to 9,000 BC. And the agent comes from two separate sources. It comes from very limited radiocarbon dated, dating, but also from the examination of the literally tens of thousands of flints and obsidian tools that are found on the hilltop. They can be easily dated to the time frame of, of, of their manufacture. And this you know, gives a, a very accurate portrayal of, of when things started kicking off there, which was about 9,500 BC. But there are a number of other structures, uh, much smaller, um, which were constructed during a slightly later phase. 
Now this was any time from about 9,000 all the way through to about 8,000 BC. Um, and you know, here's, here's a picture of them there, but we'll see what they look like in theory as they were uh, originally here and, and elsewhere. Because, as I said, they were built on, on the top of a mountain, basically. And this mountain summer, summit faces every direction. So you could see the horizon in every direction. This is, this is quite important to remember, okay? Um, so they were built on the bedrock, and what happened was that they then imported soil right from the word go, almost within the first hundred years or a couple of hundred years of the construction of the earliest monuments, which, by the way, the, the, the largest ones, the most sophisticated ones, are the oldest, which is very, very important. They started building the sophisticated monuments on the, the top of the, the bare summit, on the bedrock itself. Then they began almost immediately to start burying them in part and started decommissioning them, decommissioning them and burying and, and building new ones on top of the mound. So, and then they would, they would put more earth on and build even more. But as it was going on from the period of the oldest to the youngest, as I say, the structures were getting smaller and smaller until we get to around 8000 BC when the final enclosures, as they call them, were abandoned or decommissioned or killed, ritually killed, like you might kill a weapon by breaking it, they ritually filled in these structures and you know, completed the mound and went away. Now, I see no evidence whatsoever, and I've talked to Klaus Schmidt about this, for the abandonment at the end being something sudden. It would seem as if what happened around 8000 BC is that there were other motivations, there were new sites, new places being created in, in the area, and whatever they wanted to do at Gebekli Tepe was finished, and they just left it, basically. Um, there may have been a few things going on, you know, climate, um, you know, things like this, but generally, they finished what they were doing, they completed the mound, everything was buried, and they left, basically. Now, this is the main cluster, the main group, of, um, of enclosures, and they're all labelled um, with the letters of the alphabet. Um, there's, and we'll, we'll come on to each one separately, but there's A, B, which are, are small structures, and C, which is the largest and most complicated of the structures, which we'll come on to, and then D, which I think is the most, although this is the largest, D is the most accomplished by far. Um, then there is E, which all of the outer structure has now been removed and all that's left are the slots in the bedrock where two central pillars were placed. Um, this one dates to the same phase as, as C and D. These are the oldest three. C, D and E are the oldest three. These two are from a slightly later date, only by a few hundred years probably. These, are these ones may be 9,500 to 9,000. These ones may be 9,000, maybe to 8,500, something like that. And then recently they've uncovered one that they call F, and there's a number of stones missing here, um, which is from a much later date, probably from 8,500 to 8,000. And they've uncovered one other major enclosure to the northwest of the main ones, um, but basically that's it. And they, and they reckon that, that there's possibly as much as, as 22 other enclosures still to be... Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was uh, astonishing, really.